the the topic of who's taking care of the embryo <clears throat> came about here over the last couple years visiting you know many hatcheries throughout uh, throughout the US and noticing you know how busy um, managers supervisors are and you know just taking a look at you know who's truly taking care of that that embryo and you know, what I found is, you know, in today's hatchery, you know, hatchery managers, supervisors are extremely busy with, you know, all kinds of things that they have to focus on, leaving very little time for what's really important, and that's the embryo. Not saying that the other things that they have to focus on is, isn't important, but we're losing sight of what's really important in the hatchery, and that's that embryo. So in today's presentation, we're going to look at current scenarios in, in the hatchery today that many hatcheries face, many hatchery managers and supervisors face. We're going to look at the needs of the embryo. <clears throat> we're going to talk about who's taking care of that embryo or who's not. And then we're going to look at some advice um, and maybe do some out of the box thinking which I think is, is going to be required, you know, moving forward, because, you know, the way we've handled things in the past, for example, labor, we may need to do things a little bit differently. So let's get into it. Everybody's been faced with <clears throat> some, some sort of impact on COVID-19 or from COVID-19, be it um, hatchery staff being sick with COVID, and being, um, being out of the hatchery for extended periods of time. We've had, you know, you've had situations where people have may have been exposed to COVID-19 and they had to quarantine for two weeks before coming back to the hatchery. And, you know, we're seeing a shortage of, of staff members in our hatcheries and, and throughout um, all businesses uh, within the country. So COVID-19 is, is, has been a huge player here. <clears throat> and yes, we're all hiring. Everybody's hiring, hatcheries are hiring, you know, the mom and pop shops in, in towns are hiring. Everybody's looking for help. There's not enough folks right now to supply, you know, all the labor that's needed. So, you know, how are we going to address that? How are you guys, you know, addressing that? And this is where some of the out of the box thinking may need to take place is how can we attract people to work for us? But <clears throat> in the meantime, we have these two things going on, short of staff, COVID, <clears throat> we still have to, <clears throat> excuse me, take care of compliance issues. We're still faced with you know, having to meet all the compliance and regulatory um, aspects that, you know, our company has for the hatchery. That, you know, hatchery labor that we, we do hire no longer have the skills that they once had, meaning, you know, a lot of times this may be their first job. They're not used to working at all. This is, you know, um, they're not used to working with, with other people. So there's, there's all kinds of conflict going on. So the skill level of our employees has dropped dramatically. And then we still have to deal with internal and external audits in the hatchery amongst everything else. We have to stay within our fiscal budgeting, even though we're paying overtime because we're running short on staff where, um, you know, we've got breakdowns that need to be taken care of. So we still got to take care of our fiscal budget. And then we've got management. We've got our people management that we have to take care of on a daily basis, facility management, and management of our, our procedures, our SOPs, our systems, our protocols. All of that needs to be taken care of again um, in the face of being short in, in COVID. And then obviously we have to make sure that everybody's staying safe. We have to make sure we're following our safety protocols. 
And in crisis management, <clears throat> there isn't a hatchery out there that hasn't dealt with a crisis of some sort or another. I mean, a crisis that, you know, we're dealing with right now in most places is, you know, the, the severe staff shortage that we're dealing with. So, you know, we've got this crisis management that, that comes up every now and again. And then we got hatchery managers, supervisors, maintenance staff that are becoming production workers just to get the chicks out the door and processed, leaving very little time for the embryo in the incubation process. So on this slide, I, it's, it's a recent slide. It's a survey from March. And there's a couple things that, you know, I found quite interesting. <clears throat> and this is looking at uh, empty positions or labor shortages in manufacturing, which is the black bars, and non-manufacturing businesses, which are the blue. And you can see the amount of labor shortages, both in manufacturing and non-manufacturing businesses. And, and we fall in that, in that group somewhere. <clears throat> what I thought was very interesting is the job vacancies for more than three months. Typically, you know, we've all experienced shortages of staff, but that was because people are on vacation, people were sick, and these staff shortages lasted for maybe a few days or maybe a few weeks. But now, this is we're in uncharted territory here, folks. We've got job vacancies that are, you know, going on months, positions that are being empty for months, which is putting undue strain. And you all know this. I'm not, I'm, I'm you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, we're putting undue strain on the folks that are coming up, coming to work on a daily basis. <clears throat> so with our current scenario, you know, typically, you know, on a lot of the hatcheries that, that I've looked at and, and I've talked to, they're running on average about 30% short of staff. So that's almost a third of their staff is, is, is they're short because of COVID and other reasons. Hatcheries are struggling to get by. <clears throat> Many hatcheries are basically in a survival mode. They are trying to get chicks hatched. They're trying to get them processed and, and shipped out on a daily basis, leaving little time for much else. As I mentioned earlier, management and maintenance are becoming production workers. They're setting eggs. They're, they're running separators. They're washing um, you know, incubators, hatchers. They're in the process room. They're doing things that, um, that you know, hourly um, employees are supposed to be doing, but they have to do because we're short of help. And because maintenance is becoming a, a production worker, they're on the floor uh, taking care of, of production. Who's taking care of the preventative maintenance? Nobody. So we're falling back into a re reactive maintenance program and they're fixing what's broke. And I'm not talking just incubators and hatchers, I'm talking, you know, processing equipment, you know, a novel vaccination equipment, anything, separators, uh, washers are only getting attention when there's a problem. Same with the embryo. The only time we focus our attention on the embryos when there's a problem, poor hatch, poor chick quality. Sometimes we're delegating um, tasks that used to be, you know, a manager or supervisor's task. We're delegating, delegating that stuff to, you know, staff members with little or no knowledge of what they're doing or why it's important. You know, a lot of places, you know, they're, again, they're trying to get the work done, but we're delegating staff to you know, the third shift person or something along those lines, because they have a little more time to take care of these things. Not sure that's the right way to do it. But again, um, you know, I'm not in your situation. So if you are delegating, make sure that, you know, the individual does have some knowledge and, and the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. All too often, I see tasks that are being pushed off for later. And then once later comes, we rush through that so that we can get home to our families. 
So I'm sure this sounds very familiar to all of you. <clears throat> um, one, one thing is you're not alone. There's many hatcheries in this same scenario. You know, as I mentioned, existing staff are giving, getting overworked. How long are they gonna stay with us if we continue to work them at this rate? Which leads me to, you know, how can we properly staff the hatchery? And that's a good question. I don't have the answer. I can give you some thoughts and ideas here later in the presentation, but this is something that, you know, we're really gonna have to wrap our arms around and, and try to figure out. You know, who is gonna be, who is focused on the details, the preventative maintenance, the incubation process, the, the environment for our incubators and hatchers and the embryo. And right now we're seeing very little time focused on the embryo. A lot of times I get phone calls and, and too many times I get a phone call and it's like, hey, Henry, you know, we've got an issue on today's hatch. <clears throat> um, and, you know, a lot of these things, you know, when I go and take a look at, you know, Hatchcom or the Maestro system, the, the, the monitoring systems for JCMI, you know, I can identify something that probably should have been identified much be or longer before uh, hatch day. So, which would have given, you know, the hatchery manager, hatchery supervisor a heads up that, hey, I'm gonna have an issue this day. But a lot of times they don't know they're gonna have an issue until the day of hatch. Again, it's a lack of attention to details. And in this, in my opinion, is gonna have some long-term negative impact on, on hatch performance and chick quality. And I believe we're already starting to see some of that. So let's take a brief, quick little visit in the day in the life of a hatchery manager. Hatchery managers are usually the first to arrive at the hatchery. After they get up, dressed, have their cup of coffee. Once they're at the hatchery, they're gonna to have to wear many hats. Multitask throughout the day and then go home and usually the last ones to leave the hatchery. This is a, you know, this is the typical life of the hatchery manager. So let's look at the many hats of that hatchery manager. What are, what are some of the things, and this is truly not all inclusive. Let's take a look at some of the things that they have to take care of or they have to, um, I guess, manage. Sometimes they're, they're having to be HR, they're having to hire, they're having to fire. Um, they obviously have to be the manager, so they're having to manage the process, manage the facility, manage the employees. Sometimes they have to be a coach for a particular employee. They have to be the teacher, teach, teach a new employee how to do a particular task. They may have to be a counselor. Remember uh, on one of the first slides, <clears throat> uh, the skill level of some of these employees, they're not used to working, especially folks that have, this is their first job. You may have to counsel them a little bit on what's required um, in, in your work environment. You may have to be the, dis oops, sorry, you may have to be the disciplinarian, the mentor. Sometimes they're having to be a maintenance worker, um, you know, fixing whatever is broke. A lot of times now, and this is in red and, um, and enlarged, you know, a lot of our hatchery managers are being production workers amongst everything else they have to do. They are the leader of the hatchery, the taskmaster, the visionary, just to name a few. But again, a lot of this, a lot of these other things that, you know, that they're having to do is coming, you know, secondary after being a production worker. <clears throat> so during the day, the hatchery manager has many things that, you know, they need to focus on, be it egg management, hatcher management and transfer, making sure the transfer process is going smoothly and that we're taking care of um, you know, the eggs and the embryo during that process. Maintenance management, making sure maintenance is fixing what needs to be fixed in a timely fashion. Sanitation management, making sure that we're, you know, taking our, san our swab samples, environmental samples, making sure, you know, sanitation crews are cleaning like they're supposed to be. 
vaccination management for the Inovo vaccination or spray vaccinations afterwards? You know, are we providing the right vaccine for the right customers? Those types of things. Then fleet and delivery management. You know, they're responsible for the fleet, fleet delivery vehicles. You know, are they properly maintained? Do they have drivers scheduled to make the deliveries? All these things the hatchery manager needs to focus on. And then people management. And then all these other things that are, are pulling the, man, the hatchery manager in multiple different ways, different corporate policies, customers calling them, grow out farms calling them, breeder farms calling, DOT regulations, and so on and so forth. And then we got the ABCs, which is animal welfare, biosecurity, and safety, and compliance. <clears throat> all those things are pulling and tugging at the hatchery manager leaving very little time for incubation management. And now in the time of, of COVID, they even have less time because now they're also a production work. <clears throat> so what do our embryos require? And who's making sure that the embryos get what they need? So before we get into that, I'd like to talk about the four basic requirements that our incubation equipment or any incubation equipment needs. First, we need a good reliable source of electricity that's uninterrupted. We need the right voltage, the right amperage for our incubators and hatchers, regardless of the incubator type that you're using. <clears throat> we need the right water of the right temperature um, it needs to be clean, free of impurities, not only for cooling, but for humidification. So water is critical. We need the right compressed air. It needs to be free from water, free from oil. It needs to be at the right pressure to activate turning for those that have um, compressed air turning. And we need the proper ventilation um, in the rooms. We need the proper room temperature, incubator and hatcher room temperatures. We need the correct humidity in these rooms. We need the correct room pressures and plenum pressures. All these are requirements to make sure that the, the equipment is operating at its, at its best. So with these inputs that I just mentioned, these four inputs, good input, is going to result in a good output. And if, we, and if we're taking care of these inputs, we're going to have you know, good hatchability, good hatch fertile, and good chick quality. And as a reminder, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this information will be found in the operation manuals of your incubation equipment. So please refer to that. So let's look at the requirements for the embryo. And again, nothing new here. There's four basic requirements. I'm sure you all can, can uh, recite this. First thing is we need proper temperature. We need good even temperature, a temperature that is properly calibrated. And the temperature needs to meet the requirements of that individual. And we'll talk about that here shortly. We need the proper humidity within our incubation equipment <clears throat> to make sure that we have the correct moisture loss for that embryo so that the air cell gets large enough so when we do the internal PIP or when the embryo does the internal PIP, they can get into the air cell and, and not struggle. Turning, turning is critical and we'll talk about these here shortly. And ventilation, <clears throat> the ventilation here is basically your damper openings, making sure that the dampers are working properly and that they're calibrated properly. Again, you know, with these four inputs, if we're meeting these requirements for the embryo, we're gonna have a good outcome. So let's look at the, the four requirements or the four essentials of incubation. We need the correct and even temperature. Um, and it's the, this temperature or this thermostat is going to be, um, uh, needs to be calibrated properly 
and according to the manufacturer's recommendation. Temperature needs to be even and evenly distributed within the cabinet. We need to correct humidity and this too needs to be evenly distributed within the cabinet. The humidity sensor also needs to be properly calibrated. We need to have the correct oxygen and carbon dioxide levels within our, within our machines. And this comes through our ventilation or our damper openings. If you have machines such as the James Way single stage machines, you want them and you're using CO2 to control your dampers, by all means, you need to make sure that you're calibrating that CO2 sensor. All too often, I see hatcheries that are not calibrating these sensors on a regular basis, even though it's controlling the damper, controlling you know, the levels of carbon dioxide, humidity, oxygen within the cabinet, we're not, we're not calibrating that sensor and that's creating issues. Turning, we want, a turn, we want turning of approximately 45 degrees. And I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna briefly talk about, you know, these things. If you wanna know more about a lot of these subjects, we do have webinars, uh, past webinars, especially on turning with Dr. Wineland not that long ago. If you wanna know more about turning, please feel free to get on our website and go to that. So let's look at temperature. <clears throat> Embryonic development is controlled by the temperature. Temperature is one of the most important parameters in determining our incubation conditions. Temperature drives that incubation process. If the temperature is running too warm, too hot, we're speeding up that process. The embryo is going to run out of gas before hatching or will hatch sooner than inspect, expected. The problem is, is we're going to have hatchability issues, hatch of fertile issues, and chick quality issues if we're running faster than we should be or too hot. So on the, on the flip side, if we're running our temperatures a little too cool, we're slowing down that process. The embryo is not gonna be developed to the point it needs to be for hatching. So what you're gonna have is you're gonna have green chicks <clears throat> and, and that's gonna be a problem for hatchability and for chick quality. Green chicks do not perform well out in the field. You've got the navel that's not healed. They're gonna be prone to infection. Um, green chicks never perform very well out in the field. So you're definitely gonna have some chick quality and livability issues. So for humidity, <clears throat> this too is, is quite important, along with the damper opening to control the proper moisture loss um, within, within the machine and within the egg. Again, as I mentioned, we need the proper moisture loss so that the air cell is large enough for the internal pipping process. In multi-stage machines, in a lot of multi-stage machines, humidity can also be part of cooling. So as we're humidifying, we're, we're spraying the cool water, we're helping cool that machine down, cool the embryos down. The thing with humidity spray as part of cooling it is a localized cooling. So obviously you wanna make sure your humidity nozzles are in good repair and we're getting the spray pattern that we're supposed to be getting. In single stage machines, during that first week, we're typically looking for higher humidity. Dampers are gonna be closed. And the reason we want that higher humidity, um, it, the humidity actually helps uniformly transfer heat from the machine to the eggs. So we get good uniform heat distribution within that cabinet. So humidity is a love-hate relationship. We need humidity early on in the incubation process, at least with single stage, but then we've got to release that humidity out of that cabinet so we can get the proper moisture loss. So 
you know, as the incubation process continues, we need to reduce our humidity levels so that we can allow the formation of that air cell so it's sufficient enough for pulmonary respiration. So when moisture loss before internal pipping is less than six and a half percent, which is quite low, you're gonna have an air cell that's gonna be too small to engage in proper pulmonary respiration. So you're gonna see a lot of pips pretty much vertical in the egg, not where, not where you normally would want it to be. When that happens, that, that embryo trying to get into that air cell now gets out of the proper pipping position. And uh, a lot of times they, they won't make it out of the egg. So moisture loss is key and, and certainly one of the key parameters that should be monitored on a regular basis in the hatchery. When moisture loss is more than 18%, you're certainly risking that embryo of dehydration. So for chickens, typically moisture loss by around 18 days, we're looking for anywhere nine to 11% in single stage and in multi-stage 11 to 13%. Uh, some other incubation equipment, you may be looking at you know, 11 to 14, um, but if you're in that range, you're gonna be pretty good. But you start getting under 9%, in any incubation equipment, you're gonna have issues. A good rule of thumb that I like to do is I like to look, as I mentioned earlier, is I like to look at where the, where the embryo is pipping that air cell and where do they start um, you know, pipping out of the egg. <clears throat> is it higher than it should be? The other thing is, is that transfer, you can take a look, candle some eggs, and look at the size of the air cell. It can give you a pretty good indication of, of, of how big that air cell is and if you're in the right ballpark or not. And typically, you know, for chickens, you want about a third of the space um, inside the egg. Um, you want the air cell to occupy about a third of that space. The same with, you know, ducks or waterfowl and turkeys. Obviously, they're going to uh, sit in an incubator a little bit longer, around 24 days before transfer. Again, you want about a third of that egg occupied by the air cell by the time um, we do transfer. And here's a picture of the chicken egg. So again, about a third of the egg. So with ventilation, <clears throat> the ventilation in our machines, any, any incubation equipment, the damper is going to control the, the ventilation within these machines. Now, mindful, be mindful that, you know, we talked earlier about the requirements of the machines, making sure that we have the correct parameters in our rooms and in our plenums. So I'm assuming those are all going to be correct, you know, as we're going through this discussion. But I just wanted to bring that up to you that there's more than just the damper. We do have you know, room pressures and plenum pressures that will impact our ventilation as well. But provided everything's normal, our damper openings will control the amount of ventilation. <clears throat> We're controlling our oxygen, our CO2, and our humidity with our dampers. And in the early parts of incubation, we want a progressive increase of CO2. So with single stage incubation, early parts of incubation, dampers are closed or pretty close to being closed. We want to see an increase in CO2. This will be a natural increase as the embryo is developing. They're giving off CO2 into the environment. Humidity is also building within that environment. Later, the latter parts of incubation, we have a progressive decrease of CO2. So the latter parts of incubation, we're starting to open up our dampers. We want to lower our CO2 and increase our oxygen levels. We also want to decrease our humidity levels, again, to make sure that we're getting the right moisture loss for the embryo. Turning. <clears throat> That, you know, there's, there's all kinds of thoughts out there as to, you know, why we need to turn. 
And, and one of them is, you know, making sure that we're trying to help prevent the yolk from becoming stuck to the shell membrane. But it also is important in the development of the area of vasculosa, subembryonic fluid, our chorioanctoic membrane, or the CAM, the, the vascularization of that embryo. Turning is important for. If you have turning issues and you take a look at your hatch residue and you don't see the, the network of blood vessels all the way down to the bottom of the inside of that inner shell membrane, you know that the CAM was not fully developed. So turning is, is critical. And it also impacts the airflow over the eggs. So depending on the turn angle, it, you're gonna impact airflow over those eggs more or less depending on which way they are turned, resulting in a temperature change that the embryo is actually experiencing. It's like having an oscillating fan in front of you. Now you feel the fan and it's you know 90 degrees in your office. You feel the fan, you kind of feel cool even though it's 90 degrees. And then when the fan turns away, you feel a little bit warmer. So again, even though the temperature within the cabinet is a stable temperature, the way the air is flowing over the eggs can impact what the embryo is feeling. So turning is important for that. So what we wanna do is, is look, get, get a little more depth into the embryo and the phases of development for the embryo. There's three phases that we're gonna talk about, the endothermic, the neutral, and the exothermic phase. The endothermic phase or stage is when the embryo is, needs heat, is absorbing heat, typically that first week of incubation. So the incubator is providing heat at that point in time. The neutral stage is when the embryo is starting to produce some heat um, and typically second week of incubation. <clears throat> and the machine is heating some, cooling some, but not doing a whole lot of either. And the final stage is that exothermic stage. The embryo is producing, all, producing a lot of embryonic heat. Uh, typically that third week of incubation starting somewhere around 13, 14 days when we're dealing with chickens. And the incubator and hatcher will be typically in a cooling mode. If you see you know, a machine, if you're looking at you know, Hatchcom or Maestro, and you've got a machine that's doing a lot more heating in this third week or hatcher that's doing a lot more heating than what is normal. And that's the key is what is normal. You need to know what normal is. So you need to be monitoring this or someone needs to be monitoring this. That's a red flag if we're heating in, in, in this stage or the incubator or hatcher is heating in this stage. So there's something not right, which needs attention before hatch day. So in the endothermic phase, the embryo, as we mentioned, needs a good uniform heat. The incubator is heating up that embryo. The incubator needs to be turning and we need proper turning as close to 45 degrees as possible. <clears throat> and the reason I say that, if, if somebody says is 42 degrees okay, yeah, probably, but if 42 is okay, then someone's gonna say, well, what about 40 or what about 38? All I can say is try to get as close to 45 as possible. If all you can get is 42 or 43, then that's all you can get. But I'm not gonna be the one that says 40 degrees is, is great or 38 is gonna be great. Uh, if you wanna know more about it, again, visit that, um, that webinar that Dr. Wineland did. Um, a few months back and you can, he can shed a lot more light on, on that particular topic. Um, again, I like to get as close to 45 as possible. And we need very little ventilation during this endothermic phase. The embryo is very small at this point of time. Dampers are closed or, or very close to being closed. They might be open just a little bit. Remember, we're, we're wanting to build humidity 
naturally as the egg, as the moisture is being released from the egg, air cell starts to enlarge in slightly at this point in time. And we're naturally building CO2, as I mentioned earlier, as the embryo is developing and giving off the CO2, we're building that in that cabinet. <clears throat> Again, CO2 is important. Um, it aids in the development of that area vasculosa for the, and for the embryo itself. So let's look at the neutral phase. Remember, this is the second week of incubation. Um, we need good uniform heating and cooling. So, you know, uniform temperature throughout the cabinet. Incubator is going to do a little heating, a little bit of cooling. We still want turning during this period of time. Uh, we're going to increase our ventilation, so our damper is going to start opening up at this point in time. Humidity, we're going to start lowering our humidity. Dampers are opening up because we need to achieve the proper moisture loss, as we talked about earlier. Same with CO2. We're going to start decreasing our levels of CO2 as we increase our damper opening and as we increase our ventilation. By doing this, we're getting more oxygen into the cabinet, which is needed for embryonic development. The exothermic phase, remember this is the last week, that third week in chickens. We need, our incubators should be in at this point cooling. So we need good uniform cooling temperature. Turning is less important at this time. In our James Way machines, single stage machines, we typically um, tell customers they don't need to turn after 14 days. Now, I don't want you all going out and turning off your turning at 14 days. If, if you're not running the James Way machine, if you're running an, a different type of machine, please get with your incubator manufacturer and find out if that's okay. Because a lot of times, as I mentioned, we need that turning for a proper mix and a proper airflow within that incubator. So be careful with what you're doing there. We need an increase in ventilation. So dampers are opening up. Humidity levels continue to decrease so we can get that proper moisture loss. CO2 continues to decrease as the dampers are opening up, allowing more and more oxygen for this developing embryo. As the needs of that developing embryo requires more and more oxygen. <clears throat> So I wanted to add this graph just to show you the embryonic heat production of, you know, a typical embryo and the different requirements that, you know, the incubators need to need to take care of. So the first week of incubation, which is here, embryos are putting off very, very little heat. We're having to add heat to, to the system. Second week, embryos are putting off more embryonic heat this is that neutral phase. Incubators are a little bit of heat, a little bit of cool. And then we get into that third week and our heat production skyrockets. Embryos are putting off a lot, a lot of heat. We're pretty much running in cooling mode. And again, if we're not, we need to find out why we're not running in cooling mode. <clears throat> just another example, just to show you the different needs of of the embryo um, through the different stages. So exothermic, you know, typically in a single stage machine, we're running around a 100.4 degrees to start with. We get into that neutral phase, we're around 99.5. And in the exothermic phase, we're around 98.6. And then once we get into the hatchers, the temperature continues to decrease so that we can maintain the proper temperature for that embryo. <clears throat> and a good way to do that is just monitoring shell temperature, the egg surface temperature. And that should be somewhere around 100 degrees or so. A little over 100 degrees is fine. So some verification methods that were properly taking care of our embryo. As I mentioned, eggshell temperatures we want to, you know, we want to target at a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. If we're slightly over that, that's fine. But if we start getting too warm, um, 
that's going to create, that's going to be an indication that we're running into problems. Proper turning, making sure that we are turning every day. We don't have a, a rack or two that are not turning. So making sure that all racks are turning properly is important. We need the proper moisture loss. We talked about the, the moisture loss percentage. You know, are we monitoring it? If not, we probably should be. Fertility checks, that's important because if, if we have flocks that are, uh, have poor fertility, that's gonna impact the embryonic heat within these cabinets. So you may need to adjust your temperature set points. Breakout data, this is, this is huge because this is a great, um, I mean, you can get a lot of information from this. Dr. Bramwell did a two-part series on, on breakout. Um, and, and if you want more information on that, please go through that video or those webinars and, and you can get that information. But breakout information is great. You can tell whether or not you've got embryonic mortality early, mid, or, or late and that'll help you pinpoint if you have any issues and where they might be. Hatchcom and Maestro, uh, our JCMI um, computer monitoring systems, Hatchcom for James Way, Maestro for Checkmaster, um, strongly suggest that you get that. If you do have it, I strongly suggest that you utilize the information with, within those systems. If you don't have that, I would strongly suggest getting getting that um, getting that software to help you. <clears throat> so we're going to talk quickly. I got two slides here: one on incubators and one on hatchers on the basic requirements for you know proper incubator operation. Again, number one in my book is proper calibration. Need to be properly all all sensors, probes need to be properly calibrated. We need good preventative maintenance. We need good quality hatching eggs, which is a given. We need the correct profile and stage program for the eggs that you're hatching, whether they're uh, different breeds or different, different ages. Proper set time and proper sanitation. Again, with these six items, if we have these six items taken care of in our incubators, we're going to have a good output. And most of this stuff can certainly be found in the operation manuals of your equipment. Hatchers, same thing. Number one in my book is proper calibration, again, of your sensors, proper preventative maintenance, proper transfer process. This is important to make sure that the embryo is being taken care of between the incubator and hatcher. We need to correct profile or stage program for that hatcher. And we need our proper pull times. This is important. It's important that we're not pulling at a specific time of the day. When I was running hatcheries, my motto was we do not pull chicks before their time. So if we had to, if we have to work around hatchers, we worked around hatchers. If we had to delay start, we delayed start. If we had to start early, we started early. We did what was best for the embryo. <clears throat> so um, we need our proper pull times. And of course, proper sanitation within our hatchers. Again, we meet those six inputs and we're gonna have a good output. You're gonna have a good result. And again, this can be found in the manuals. <clears throat> and this leads me to timely and proper response for alarms. A lot of times I go to hatcheries and the alarms are blaring and they continue to blare and nobody's addressing the alarms to me within a timely fashion. <clears throat> now, whether or not they know what that alarm is and they don't feel it's important or whatever, but alarms are there for a reason. They indicate there's an issue. It needs to be, it needs to be taken care of and it needs to be taken care of properly. <clears throat> Again, I go to hatcheries and I see doors open, especially like in hatchers. I see hatchers doors open 
And the reason they're open a little bit is to satisfy the alarm so that we're not getting an alarm. Well, to me, that is not the proper response to be taking, one, for the equipment, and two, for that embryo. They're still overheating. We just got air going over that sensor, making sure it's not alarming. So you're really not solving anything. And it's not even a Band-Aid, in my opinion. And you know we need to make sure that we're taking care of this, finding the root cause of these alarms, and making the necessary repairs. And I understand short of help, maintenance doing production work, but again, it's important that somebody is focused on this. We have to, or, or we're, gonna run, we're gonna run into trouble. And timely means we need to respond as quickly as possible. <clears throat> so who's taking care of our embryo and our hatcheries? Is it time for action? Is it time for a paradigm shift on how we, how we staff our hatcheries? You know, for JCMI incubation, attention to these detail is of utmost importance. It's paramount. Every year we're losing more and more experienced and skilled hatchery managers. And this is due to retirements and promotions and, and folks just leaving the job. So every year we see less and less experienced and skilled hatchery managers run these multi-million dollar facilities, which you know puts them in a, in a bit of a bind. They're not necessarily maybe ready for that jump yet. And then hatcheries are typically staffed with less skilled maintenance. You know, for 10 years plus, hatchery managers have been getting pulled away from the role of incubationist by you know, all kinds of other demands that we talked about earlier, compliance, safety, biosecurity, so on and so forth. And, you know, now it's really coming to a head when we're short of staff. Companies still expect you know, the embryos to be managed. And truth be known, in some hatcheries, it's the embryos not being managed very well. So if the hatchery is being challenged to perform they need the proper tools at their disposal to be able to perform at the levels that they're being expected to. So we need the right incubation equipment, we need the labor, so on and so forth. For many years, incubation companies like James Way and Chickmaster have developed incubators and hatchers that required less attention. They're a lot more automated, better controls, HatchCon Maestro, but what we do, we, we built bigger hatcheries with more machines, which is all fine and dandy, but with the increased labor shortages felt in the industry and managers that are performing hourly functions along with their own responsibilities, it's leaving little time or no time to be focused on the embryo. Is it time that we hire someone that's it's their sole responsibility is to be focused on the embryo in our hatcheries. Is it time that we hire an incubationist? So let me jump on my soapbox here for a moment. <clears throat> Every hatchery has individuals that are focused on animal welfare, compliance, biosecurity, sanitation. We have sanitation officers, compliance officers, and, and that type of stuff. Managers don't have time to focus on the embryo. So who's taking care of the embryo? And in a lot of hatcheries, no one is. So in my opinion, we certainly need to hire someone that is truly focused on the embryo. Someone that we can call an incubationist or an incubation attendant or something along those lines that we train to know what needs to be done. Is it time for a paradigm shift on how we staff our hatcheries? <clears throat> So some thoughts and ideas. We certainly want to automate as much as possible. A lot of hatcheries are automating, um, you know, as much as they can. The thought of hiring or training an incubation or an incubation attendant, I think is important. You know, hiring a facility manager, someone to manage the facility and the people and, and that type of deal, and then have someone that is focused on the embryo or the incubation side of things might be a thought. 
we need to increase the the skill level of maintenance within these hatcheries. We've got multi-million dollar hatcheries that have <clears throat> robotics and all kinds of electronics and automation, and yet the skill level in these hatcheries are still way down here. I think it's time we, we up the skill level in our maintenance in our hatcheries. So as I mentioned earlier, we're certainly in uncharted territory and we need to start thinking out of the box for staffing solutions. The way we've staffed hatcheries in the past, I, I don't know if that's gonna work anymore and it certainly doesn't look like it is. A lot of hatcheries are looking towards contract labor and, and that's certainly helpful, but I hear you know a lot, of the con a lot of the companies providing contract labor, they're having trouble finding folks. So I don't know if that's the solution either. It might be part of it. Work release programs. I've, I've run work release programs before in hatcheries with much success. Um, you do have a reliable source of, of individuals coming into the hatchery. The one, the one fallback is they're not there for very long. You may have them for, for six months to maybe a year, and then you'd have to get you know, some other individuals. But again, they typically are transported to the hatchery and um, it, it certainly works out. And again, it all depends on where you're located. Split shift ideas. And I don't mean first, second and third shift. I mean, you know, four hours, you know, somebody's working four hours and then somebody comes in after and works, you know, four hours midday and then someone works in the afternoon for a few hours. We may need to start looking at something along those lines, splitting up our typical first, second and third shifts. To get people, you know, hire retirees for certain positions. There's a lot of different things out there, other ideas that that you guys probably have come up with or can come up with, but I need to, I think we need to really think out of the box here. So quickly, some advice, <clears throat> definitely use Hatchcom and Maestro if you have it, use it to its capabilities. If, if not, you know, if, you, if you're not sure how to use it, please let us know. We can certainly help with that. The other thing is allow the JCMI tech team access to Hatchcom and Maestro computers. A lot of times we get asked to, to provide some help with COVID and travel restrictions. It may, it's a lot of times difficult to get somewhere. And then we can't get access to the Hatchcom or Maestro computer. So if we could get access to that, um, that would be helpful. So that's something that, you know, you guys could work on maybe ahead of time is getting access, you know, temporary ask access or something along those lines for us if we're, if we're asked by you for assistance. <clears throat> if you don't have Hatchcom or Maestro, certainly contact us and we can certainly help you out with that. Uh, you definitely need a functioning independent backup alarm system. I've been to hatcheries where um, it's functioning, but people have turned it off because they didn't like to hear the alarms. And, and again, it needs to be functioning. The, the backup alarm systems are there to help protect that embryo. Make sure that machines are properly calibrated. We need to provide the proper room and plenum pressures for our machines, as I mentioned earlier. Proper preventative maintenance. And somehow, some way, we need to focus our, our attention back to what's important in a hatchery, and that's the developing embryo. And we need to train somebody who's going to be responsible for taking care of that embryo and come up with some out of the box thinking for staff solutions. And as I conclude, <clears throat> my, last, my last comment is read the manual, um, be it the Chick Master, James Way manuals, a lot of good information in, in those manuals. If you need them, please let us know. If you need electronic versions, please let us know.